I'm psychologist Dr. Brian Violet, and today I'll be sitting down with Barbara Bataro. She's a mother of seven and my close friend. You may hear references to her husband, Greg, whom I also interviewed. Link is in the description. We'll be talking about her conversion to the Catholic faith, her love of cats, which she tries to convince me to also love. I'm still not really sure why. Uh, we'll be talking about what it's like to be married to a therapist or what it's like to be a therapist from my perspective. And her Sinner and a Movie Choice of the Week, Mary Poppins. This is The Catholic Sinner Show. I'm all about de-stressing people, minimizing the anxiety, and helping people to feel comfortable. In That's your general vocation. In life. <laughs> so certainly <laughs> on my show. Um, you're, you have no idea what we're going to talk about, really. You were concerned. Mm -hmm. I asked you to be on my show, and you said, what are we going to talk about? Yes. And so the first topic that I want to discuss with you is... Why, am I, why do I have a cough drop? Yeah, we can talk about that. No, we can talk about what a trooper you are coming on the show, even though you're not the healthiest. There's no virtue signaling, actually. <laughs> not wearing a mask. Not wearing a mask. Um, Where you're so sucking on a cough drop. Yep. I can't tell. Oh, good. Well, that's why I was bringing it up. But anyway, go, but go, but okay. What's mm. the first? That's how you. Is that how you master the, <laughs> the distress by calling attention to it? In, well, in, case thinking, everyone, like, in case anyone notices I'm having a cough drop, I'm going to tell you first, I'm having a cough drop. I mean, isn't it kind of strange? They're like, what's wrong with her mouth? And then all of a sudden it'll be gone. And maybe they'll still say what's wrong with her mouth, but... <laughs> but it has nothing to do with the cough drop. <laughs> it won't be the cough drop. <laughs> no, the first topic I want to talk about is uh, barn cats. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So... This should derail fast. Why? 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 I want to understand why. You have a fascination with barn cats. Um, I think you got your first collection of barn cats when you didn't have a barn. But now you have a barn. Mm -hmm. They so don't live there. They don't live in the barn. They're patio cats. Yeah. Patio cats. Oh, gosh. Well, and it depends on how long you want to talk about this for, but... As long as you would like. I love cats. I've had cats almost my whole life except for the time between when I got married and when we got our first set of barn cats, which was 2020. Um, so for, there was a seven year gap between owning, owning cats. Um, in any case, you had feline withdrawal for seven years. Yeah, I had feline withdrawal. Um, but because of the place that we lived, though it didn't have a barn, you know, we were out in the country and um, we needed some mousers. And so um, actually we got them before we moved, anticipating that we would need mousers. Hmm. And um, Are you we, scared of mice? Are you as, what are you more scared of? Because I saw you react to a spider about 10 minutes ago and it was... At a clinical level, your response was at a clinical level. Are you more scared of mice or spiders? Um, I don't like either, but what I don't like about mice is that you don't know that they're there until it's already out of control, right? So that when you finally start seeing like, oh my goodness, there are... There are many mice. There, then there's yes. like the, the mouse situation is far beyond like what I can handle. So I don't like either, but <laughs> the place that we were moving into had been abandoned and so... You know, when we went into the garage for the first time, there was like a rat skeleton. So like to get from dead rat to rat skeleton, to, to get from live rat to rat skeleton, I mean... It's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. There's a lot going on. There was a lot going on in that house. So in any case, I decided I would adopt cats that were already like feral. Um, got in touch with like a barn cat rescue organization. Oh, you didn't get them from kittenhood. Mm -mm. Oh. No. And so I told the people, like, what we're hoping for is to have some barn cats. Um, but because I homeschool, we would really like something that's kind of around. Like, we want to give the kids the experience of having um, pets and, and all of that stuff. Make sure they don't <clears throat> torture the kid, the cats, the animals. Well, or make sure that the cats are not biting the kids, right? Or that they're mm. just, like, not present at all. Like, it would be kind of nice to have, like cats like sort of roaming around this is before kids... you got your first dog 
With the kids. Mm, before we got our first dog. Yeah. Yeah. Mistake. But anyway. Um, the dog's mistake? The dog, I, I mean, he's, I, that's a whole other thing. It's, You're too He's hard. getting better. You're way too hard on that dog. He's like, getting better. Let's stick with the cats. We're going to stay on the rails. Yeah. All right. But we could do a whole section on mushroom your dog, but let's stick with the cats. So to make a long story long, we got this. It really these, is dragging on. It's really <laughs> dragging on. It's really dragging on. I haven't asked my follow-up question yet. Where? The why is because we needed mousers. Okay. Okay. Not, we thought we and needed you, mousers. And you love cats. And I really like cats. I have a complicated history with cats. Oh. I don't trust them. Most people. Oh, that's interesting. I don't trust them. I had a cat that I found as a kitten in the parking lot of Stop and Shop that we took home. His name was Taffy. He was a great cat. And then he got sick. And I was still young. And he got to a point where, like, you couldn't pet him or you'd get bitten or scratched or something. And I just didn't really understand. So it's like he basically turned on me, you know. Mm. And... um Ever, that give you trust issues. Yeah. And ever since, I don't, like, I've been at people's houses where they're like, oh, my cat, my cat's different. My cat's like a dog. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll give cats another chance. I'm petting the cat. Then they turn over on their belly. Mm-hmm. And, like, I'm figuring dogs love their bellies pet. Why wouldn't cats? And I'm rubbing it. And the cat's purring and loving it. And all of a sudden, for yeah. no reason whatsoever... I didn't do anything different. I didn't speed up my hand. I didn't touch a different spot. I get bitten, and mm-hmm. then they run away. It's like, yeah, I, I can't predict. They're very unpredictable. Is that they fair? can be unpredictable. Yeah. It's not helping my trust issues. Well, but don't you think that there is like a certain level of predictability in knowing that they're going to be unpredictable? So like, if you can actually learn the behavior of a cat, it's very clear like when a cat's had enough. And then you just are not going to get bit because you're like going to respect the boundary. I'm pointing towards the floor because that's where my cats usually are. I don't know where the boundary is though. Oh, you just have to learn cat a little cat behavior. Okay. I feel like it's a moving goalpost. Mm. It depends on what kind of cat you have. If you have a good cat or a bad cat. Oh, there are different types. So these. How, so how are you going to know if your barn cat is a good cat or bad cat because it's oh. not in your house? Well. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the first three that we got were feral, but the idea was that we're going to have these cats and they're going to be friendly. And the woman said, they're absolutely, I have the best cats for you. They're living in this abandoned house. The house is going to be torn down. It's a tiny little three cat colony. They're so sweet. She sent me videos of them. You know, people are holding them and petting them. And I said, these are the perfect cats for us. This is fantastic. So we got them. Then there's a whole acclimation process so they know who's feeding them where they need to come back to, right? Because eventually you're going to let them out. He, so they start inside. They start inside. So like a first, like a big dog crate, right? Like you're, you're safe. Them. You're our domesticated animal. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> then good luck with the foxes. Right. And then into the garage, right? Yeah. Well, um, we had gotten these cats, like I said, before we moved, but we'd put them in the new house. We could acclimate them. So every single day I was traveling back and forth about 45 minutes each way to feed the cats twice a day and, you know, give them like some presents and all of this stuff. Not, not like presents, but like, like a presence of a human. You yes. Know? That's quite the commitment. 45 minutes. Yeah. Each way. Yep. For how long? Oh gosh. I think we did it for like six weeks. It was a really long acclimation process. And then I said, we have lots of time. So yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, let's do it. It's today's the day. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to let them out. And meanwhile, the cats hadn't been quite friendly, but I just assumed like, you know, they're not happy being pent up. Um, we let them out. One of them never came back, Oh, but he was spotted in Where Fairfield. Where do you think he is now? Um, where do you wish he is now? Where do you hope he is now? And then, and then where do you think he is now? I think he's probably not around i hope he's in he's at someone else's house by, let's by him... not around you mean i think he's dead dead okay Just i can't wanna... be sure <laughs> but you're hoping sure. he's like curled up by a fire i hope that he's with someone who lets him be an indoor outdoor cat okay because his desire to be outside is great you like freedom he needs they need freedom that's what cats are hunters and they have they start to get really um cooped up they start to get really neurotic if they're not allowed outside. You understand this personally. Are we talking about you right now? No. Okay, just cats. <laughs> just the cats. Anyway, 
the bottom line really is that um, we have had nine cats. Yes. We've done three sections of threes. And um, we are down to three. From nine? From nine. Wow. It really helps you to detach, doesn't it? That's like the line of inquiry I wanted to explore. Like, do you, do you care about them individually? Not like you do your kids or mushroom your dog. Like, you're kind of detached. It's like, at any day, any day now might be the last day I see this cat. There's a level of detachment hmm. that you have to have, right? Yeah, yeah. Really, for anything. Definitely when you have barn cats. Mm-hmm. And and um, oddly enough, one of our cats actually stowed away in the truck the other day, and I didn't realize it. Um, we drove 20 minutes away. I got out of the car with the baby. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm at home, and I'm like, has anybody seen Charbel? Like, where's Charbel? And because they stay at the patio, they stay on the patio, and they are light. It's like having a dog that just hangs out at right. home. Right. Uh, again, long story short, he stowed away. Jumped out of the car. We were near a daycare center. He saw a bunch of kids, went to the daycare center. They um, took him in, posted a couple ads around. I saw the ad and I thought, there's no way that that's that's Charbel because it's 20 minutes away. How in the world did he (laughs) get that far away? It was Charbel. Wow. No one noticed. I think he didn't plan on the car moving. And I think he got scared because he's little and he just hid in the truck. And then... When you say truck, you have a truck? We have a, I, I call it a truck. It's a sprinter van, apparently. <laughs> I was not trying to be difficult. Oh. I, I was confused <laughs> when you kept referencing the truck you're making fun of it. that I had never seen, but that is, it's a great opportunity for vulnerability. Yeah. Well. Well, when I met you, you used to drive a minivan. You had a bumper sticker that said, I used to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's a part of you that's not happy about driving a sprinter. I don't like, I don't like a van. I like a truck. It's like a diesel Four-wheel drive, those things to me say truck. How many people would see your vehicle and say, there's a good-looking truck? One. One, just you? Just me. me. (laughs) But even still, it'd be tough for him to get in the van. Like, what happened? The kids were... Oh, they really like to be with us, the cats, right? So just opened the truck, and I was putting the baby, you know, buckling the baby in. And um, I think that just the door was open. It's like, a, you know, a wide open thing. And they just, they're curious. So they just pop in and... They're silent killers. Si- mini panthers. Mm. He's all black, you know, hard to detect. You hear so many stories out in the wild. I used to live in Denver for a little while. And you, oh. hear, you hear stories about uh, wild cats and how they stalk you. Mountain lions. For miles. Silently. I, there's one story I heard where this woman was running along a road. and Some dude uh, pulls up in a truck next to her and he's like, get in. She's like, I'm not getting in with you. He's like, trust me, you want to get in. He's like, I've been watching this mountain lion track you. And you see all these pictures too of like people with like a mountain lion like right here, right behind right, you. Right, it's like a family know. photo of the birthday party and behind, terrifying. Yeah, they're they're silent, aren't they? It's terrifying. I mean, mm. as much as I like cats, in my mind, I'm always like, you know, checking next door to see if there are any mountain lion sightings in Connecticut. And despite the fact they're not supposed to be here, on occasion... Oh, mountain lions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've seen them. In Connecticut? Mm-hmm. Impossible. Yeah, bobcats, mountain lions. Bobcats. Little, uh, I don't think they're a lynx. Are they a lynx? No. I think the bobcat is in the lynx family. Okay, yeah. No, there's mountain lions. There's mountain lions right down the road from here. I've seen, there's been one sighting. I mean, you just bears. I have a golf course near my house. There's a bear that walked through my golf course. Bear. And I live... I mean, I feel like I live in a more suburban area than you do, so you're in trouble. I mean, <laughs> that's terrifying. Bears, not a big deal. I'm like, bears. Yeah. Mountain lions? Yeah, bears don't want to be bothered, really. Yeah, mountain lions are scary. Mountain lions are looking to eat you. Bears are just looking to eat your food. Yes. Um, okay. So, not really that attached. No yeah. real special moments? Any real special moments? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Getting Charbel back was a, I mean, extraordinary dream. Yeah. And oh, yeah, for sure. The kids. Rubbing against the leg. That's another gripe I have with cats. It's like when you get out of the shower and you're so clean, they find a way to just. Ruin it. Yeah, right on the leg. Well, you know, they're not indoor or outdoor. They're strictly outdoor. Are you happy about that? Yes and no. Part of me is very glad because I don't, I'm not interested in that. 
hair, blah, 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 litter box, a lot of kids, low to the ground. Fur ball coughing up. Fur ball coughing up. They destroy up. the furniture. You got to get them to scratch. And indoor outdoor cats, yeah. when they love you, hunt, and then they bring it indoors. Yes, they bring like mice as a present. Sometimes not fully dead. Birds. And mice. Uh-huh. Frogs. Frogs. And then, and then what do you do? What do you do? What do you do with a half dead animal in well, your you, house? You throw it in the garbage. Not half dead. You kill it first and then throw it in the garbage? How? With a shovel. You make your husband kill it with a shovel? I'm going to let Greg know we can have indoor cats now. <laughs> I'm Problem sure, solved. I'm sure among your seven children, one of them would be happy to smash. To smash. With a... Well, maybe not. Your kids have a... Have... I mean, if I came on the, sh- the, the show and I was like, I have kids who are willing to smash a live animal in the head with a shovel. What do you think about that? I think happily. I think Greg would be like, "Let me show you how. <laughs> Let me show you how to smash an animal to put out of its misery." Or you take it to a wildlife rescue. A half dead frog. I've done it. They give them antibiotics, stitch them right up, and hope for the best. Because a cat bite is filled with bacteria. Wow. Yeah. I didn't think we were going in this direction. Neither but, did I. But here we are. <laughs> here we are. So I'm really not the cat expert because. We're, we're down to three from nine. Okay. Well, you're striving, trying your best to contribute best. to the cat community. Yeah. I respect it. It's just not for me. Different strokes for different folks. Well, yeah. I was thinking when you were saying um, that, you know, so many people have said, like, my cat is like oh, a right. dog. Right. And then I was thinking, like, that I'm... That you're I'm one, one, of, you're those one of those people. people, yeah. And I'll probably continue to do it. And your cat will betray me. You're, just like, just like all cats. <laughs> I don't trust them. I, uh, yeah, but I think maybe you just, I truly, you just need to be able to read the signs, just like a dog. And you're just like a cat person. All cat people try to convince me that I need to get over my stuff so that I can have a cat. So when you I, can love cats. But I don't ever, why do I ever need to have one? But don't you feel like it's a certain lack of vulnerability if you, because this is what, this is. My vulnerability? Yeah. What? Say more. I. Um, I have noticed that people who don't like cats um, don't like giving up control. Where dogs are much more easily manipulated, cats are not. And so when someone's like, I just don't, I just, I just don't like cats. Like, what is that? What is it? Let's do a U-turn yeah. and talk about. My control issues? Yeah. I'd like to think that I have far less control issues than I used to have. I... Um... I think for me at this point, they're just not relational enough. Not, it's not that I need to control them, manipulate them. I don't, I mean, my dog, if, you know that people say that their cats are like dogs? My dog is like a cat. I mean, we go away and we're like... And he doesn't care. We're, no, we forget. We forget about him. We forget about the dog. I have a little, a little English bulldog and he, is, he just sleeps like 95% of his life. He gets excited when he sees you, goes on like a four-minute walk every day, and that's it. So I'm fine with offering that freedom. So it's not about control for me. I'm not saying I don't have control issues, but with animals, I don't. Um, to me, it's like, I can't get in there. I can't, like, I can grow my dog. It's a know? connection. You feel like it's a yeah, connection I don't feel, issue. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't connect with cats, but I can connect with dogs. I don't need a control. I feel like they, they're, I think that's probably actually my issue. Like, the thing that triggers me the most is when people, like, wall me off, or, like, stonewall me. Like, I can fight. If someone comes attacks me and fights me, someone I love, like, all right, let's fight. I love right. that. But if someone, like, doesn't. And they shut it down. They shut Yeah. That's, and that's a cat. Perpetually a cat. Cat is constantly shutting you down. Emotionally. I think you, I think you need to get to know my cats. Uh, okay. I've heard that they, before. They follow us around the yard. Yes. Like, Mary had a little lamb. Mm. We call their name. They follow us back. Like they, they want, they want, they so desire connection. I haven't not had a, con- a moment with your cats before. I mean, I'll just be outside and suddenly there'll be something rubbing against me and, you know, I'll let it. So that's good enough, right? Don't you feel like letting and embracing are different? Yes. Yes, they are. Are you ready to embrace? No. Okay, we'll get you there. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. We'll see. Well, maybe I just need to be more 
secure. More of, more of a facilitator or what? More secure in my love of my own cats. I think that they're great. Yeah, not and everyone needs to love cats. Not everyone needs to love cats. <laughs> Or You're not cats. less than if someone doesn't like what you like. My cats aren't less than. This is an important question I have for you too. This watch this segue. This is elite level segue. Let's do it. So you're exploring how you don't need other people to like what you like. But you get extremely passionate about things for a time. Oh yeah? Yes. I've noticed this. Like like the cats. So what is your I don't know what you're going to say right now. What is your latest thing that you're all about? Oh, gosh. It's so really embarrassing that you pick up on that. I'm really curious what your other examples are besides the cats. Um, I have an attention span that is um, easily disrupted. But like um, such a misconception with um, with ADD or ADD, ADHD is that there's no attention span. There's like a locked in attention span. You have ADHD? Span. I have some, definitely some, um, some, what's the word I'm looking for? Some tendencies, tendencies or, yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. I can hyper, hyper, hyper focus to the mm. exclusion of everything else. So what am uh-huh. I hyper focused on right now? Yes. The idea that um, I am really into sewing and upholstery. <laughs> there it is. I knew it was there somewhere. Yeah. Um, sewing and upholstery right so yeah but i'm not good at either and i Mm. don't have the desire or attention span to like go into it deeply so that i you know like starting like let's let's figure out how to put this bobbin on the the, sure it's very like requires a lot of attention to detail doesn't it i wouldn't know i'm like plug it in and let's do it so Mm. i did a few halloween costumey kind of things and i tried to do a chair and Let's scratch the itch just once a year. Make Halloween costume. That's it. Yeah, so I am just okay with it being less than mediocre. Mm. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I'm probably just going to have somebody else make cushions for the dining room chairs. Instead of you. Yeah. That's a big thing in your home. Greg, yeah. Greg, your husband, likes to do the work and create something and craft Yes. It's, it's the spirit of the home. I don't want to pay, so I'll do it myself. I, will, I like that too. I will figure out how to do it. Well, right. But the difference between Greg and I is that Greg will start from the bottom and like learn the steps. You just jump in. And I'm, yeah, we're full speed ahead over here. And <laughs> like, I didn't even read the start guide. I just plugged it in and was like, why doesn't it work now? I don't like instructions either. So I, I went with it. It's serving my kind of purposes. Yes. So sewing and upholstery. Yeah. And sewing upholstery. <laughs> yeah. In fact, my father in law's really into it. Mm. And when I mentioned to my mother in law that I was that I was gonna do cushions, she said, Oh, why don't you let him do it? And I said, Oh, I have my whole thing set up. Mm. As if I'm this It's an opportunity to bond with him, right? Maybe. I don't think I think sewing is probably It's a solo activity. I think so. Maybe like in a knitting circle. Sure. But is that what's next? The knitting circle? I already tried. I already went through that phase. Mm. It didn't last long. Were there, were there other people involved no, in this circle? No, no, no. Just, just you. I tried. To, I just went the through The circle of one. The <laughs> circle of one. I tried to start knitting. Um, got all the stuff. Realized, like, can't do that. And Yes. So anyway. Well, there's two areas that I did not want to talk about today because I figure people ask you these kinds of questions all the time. Um but I'm interested because it sounds like you're going to do it anyway. No, I'm going to take a... I'd like to take a, circu- a circuitous r- route Ooh. into the area of discussion. So one would be your husband. People know who he is. Do they? Catholic people know who he is. Catholic people do. Yeah. I mean, there's probably people watching this that are like, Barbara Bataro? <laughs> probably. They're, but are they like that or they're like, Barbara, Barbara Bataro? Bataro. <laughs> um, so I don't want to talk to you... Well, maybe I do, but in a different way. Um, and the other area is the fact that you have many children. I'm sure you get a lot of dumb questions about that. And the angle I want to take into that question is, you might have already answered it, which is that you don't have a good answer. Uh, what are these kids holding you back from? <laughs> what I mean is like, when, the, when they grow up... More cats. Well, no, you're, no. no, you are extremely talented woman. You're very bright, you're very creative. 
I know you use that creativity as a mom within like the context of your parenting, but sure. I mean, I, can you even see above the tree line at all to know that someday you're, there will not be seven plus children all hanging at your legs? Like, have you thought about what you want to do later? Or do you want to be a cat lady? Are they preventing you from being a cat lady? Are they preventing you from sewing with the poultry? <laughs> or is it that you just go from thing to thing, you'll always go from thing to thing, so you don't have a big grand plan for what you may want to do later? Or do you want to just sit on a beach later? Like, what do you want to do? Have you thought about your future? Um, that's such a good question. That's such a great question. Right now, they're not keeping me from anything, right? Like, we do... We do stuff like drag them with me. <laughs> we're just we're like in it together, so hardcore. Um, like the other day, we just in the afternoon, um, we just decided that we needed to make a catapult, mm -hmm. and uh, because we had this big tree that we're probably going to have to cut down, but it's a, a black walnut tree, and so you know, like chestnuts are like this; they still hurt. Black walnuts are like the size of a tennis ball. Yeah. Um, and I had gotten a text message in the middle of the day. Greg was working. Um, <clears throat> You know, keep the kids out of the front yard. It's like a war zone. I'm like, well, what could that mean? Oh, it's the black walnuts. Like they're, you know, they're, they're. So anyway, we're like, what are we going to do today? We have some scrap wood because again, we're like working on a house. And uh, I thought like, let's just do it. So I grabbed like my little tool bag of stuff and uh, Elijah grabbed, he's like, I think this will work. It was like one of the bungee cords from the back of the truck or van, depending on who you are. Um. <laughs> And we just made it. And we thought it was going to be way more exciting because the base was massive. It's exciting. I saw videos of this catapult. Well, the base is like this big, you know, so you're like really gearing up for something like that's going to be. But again, it's not like we started with like measurements and, you know, like the proper material. So we were just, you There's know. not enough force in the. Exactly. So I think I go, it's like so this it like, huge Ooh. setup to go like six feet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but then we, you know, put a wheelbarrow out there and we were trying to shoot it into the. It's just something to do. Yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, that, all that's to say that, um, there's not a lot that they're holding me back from. And I think, yeah, but that, but you're in some ways evading my question. I know you do amazing creative things as a mom with your kids, Sure, but what like, I like to do without like them? if it was like, yeah, like when there's space to like, are you, have you thought about another career? Have you thought about big time hobbies? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to fill your time with? Yeah, I think, um, I assume Greg and I will probably, um, I feel like there's a sailboat uh, in our future, right? Mm. Like, so captain's licenses would be kind of something that would be there. Um, that's been like a decade. Like being out on the water? Uh, mm, yeah, actually. Uh, you sure? Yeah, no, yeah. It's a funny <laughs> question because when I met Greg, I would much rather have been in the mountains and I was like, or mm. at a pool instead yes. of the beach. Well, beach and on the water are different. I, I like the beach more than the water, on the water. Yeah, I don't like to be in the water. Hmm. So I like to be on the water in a boat, sure. Yep. Um, I don't like to be far out in the water, but I do mm. think like... It's pretty dicey out there. When it you, is dicey. When you go out. It is dicey. But yeah. I hope to, you know, I I would like to... I would I just want to grow so much as a person. That sounds really foofy, but truly like to let go of the things that are really... Just to be more and more detached. Um, mm -hmm. From whatever it is, fears, control, you know, the idea, whatever I think I need, right? Yes. And a boat is sort of like, you, you got to kind of let a lot go yeah. to get out on, on a boat. Yeah. The way that Greg and I talk about um, being out on a boat is sort of like, you know, sell everything kind of situation and, and like live on a boat um, kind of kind of thing, not just people like... People do it. People totally do it. And um, they don't... I haven't seen anyone doing it with seven little kids, some of them who aren't swimmers yet. Yeah. And the other thing too is like, if you want to travel the world in your boat, then yeah. you have to cross an ocean yeah. in your boat. Right. I would have a hard time with that. <laughs> it's, that's really it's, scaring me. It's terrifying. It, it's connected to my problem with cats somehow. I'm not sure how. <laughs> Control. Predictability? <laughs> yes. Um, there's actually a good movie. What is it called? We'll have True to, Spirit. We'll have to watch it the next time you're on the Catholic Center show. Yes, um, but you don't like movies, so anyway, go. No, on. but it's a good, it's a sailing movie, and it is. It'll make your heart like go into your throat. Yeah, and also then you'll cry. I think it's really it ends up anyway. I don't want to give it away, but spoiler. Um. So anyway, so that's probably one thing, I guess. Um, 
I don't know. I'm really career looking... anything career oriented or no? We've talked about you doing what I do. I know, but then I look at you and Greg and Teresa and Stephanie and Gerard and Sean. And, and you're all miserable. <laughs> no, and then I think like I will never be that good. I am, oh, you know, lacking. No, of... you're not giving yourself enough credit. Listen, there's something about clinical work. There's this phrase, and I love basketball, and in basketball there's this phrase they say, you can't teach height. <laughs> right. I think there's, there's something about that in clinical work where yeah. there are natural gifts. Typically what happens is someone is absolutely traumatized in their childhood, okay. like, like me. 90% of people. Check. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and then you're forced into a position where you're actually training to do clinical work from like five years old. You're paying attention to dynamics right. in your home. You're learning how to keep people happy. Right. You're observing behavior. You're picking up on patterns. And so by the time you get to you know, career choice time, yeah. it's really just about honing your skills and just right. like learning, I don't know, just adding knowledge to it and curbing things because we, we tend to go in one direction or the other in terms of our personality. Some people are better at empathy. Some people are better at challenging. There's different facets of doing clinical work. But what I know about you is you're extremely extremely insightful this is this is the segue to talking about greg a little bit i remember oh great i remember i remember um a comment you made which was surprising to me because you greg myself and Teresa were all hanging out mm -hmm. and you made a, some some comment to the effect of like i'm hanging out with a bunch of therapists and when you made that comment i was like oh She's not a therapist. Right. Like I yeah. I almost forgot. You slide into that role of talking about people so easily. And that's just the norm for us. I mean, I married a therapist. Right, so right, like, right. like we we yeah. live and move and have our being in the yeah. world of psychology here. So um like you have those gifts. And probably some of it has, I imagine, worn off from being married to your husband, Definitely. Greg. Sure. Um yeah. thank God for him. Yeah. So I, I guess my question is what is it, what's that like, being a non-clinician married to a clinician? Ooh. Are there times you're like, don't psychoanalyze me? Like, or, you know, like, I, I'm, we don't have to talk about the tension points. There could be <laughs> joyful moments too, but like overall, what's the experience of like... I a cigarette and I'm like... <laughs> um, you know, no. This should be a couch, I actually. <laughs> right, right. I just kick my feet up. I'm like, get your notebook out. Yeah. Um, what is it like? Uh, there's so that's such an open-ended question. What about from the beginning, the first time? Like it must be like, wow, this guy's different than a lot of dudes because he talks about things like feelings and stuff. No, Greg and I are very, very different. Mm -hmm. Like, um, there's a lot that's that's very similar about us, right? Sometimes that's a pressure point. Like we're both the oldest, right? And yeah, and that can be tricky. Um, but I think that what Greg is really good at, I is not a s strong skill set for me usually. Um, I'm sure there's some things that overlap for both of us. Um, and what some of the things that I am good at is not at the top of Greg's skill set. So in our dynamic, I tend to bring like more humor, right? Whether it's avoidant or or just realizing like, this actually can lighten up and it doesn't need to be so heavily mm. like psychoanalyzed and focused on like, how are we going to, you know, improve this in our family or did it, like come Lord Jesus. Like sometimes things are just going to be as they are. And like, we're just going to kind of detach from it. Mm. Um, when Greg and I met, I was um, outside of the church and the thing that I saw about him that was so different wasn't necessarily anything related to psychology, but oh no, he has a really um, beautiful, uh, childlike playfulness. You no, know, like heart and disposition, sort mm. of. Not even playfulness, but like, like purity of heart. A purity of heart. Yeah. Um, and you'll see it like if he watches a Disney movie. Um, and it's just this like it's like this seeking, this beautiful seeking. And so what I hadn't bumped up against before was um, his just like profound respect for himself and and for women in general but for me mm -hmm. right which and uh it would that was what was shocking mm. like where did that come from right um and he was he really stood his ground on it and so um immediately it was like this ability for me to trust him because uh, he was protecting you even from yourself 
from from and and like and he was protecting himself from, from parts of you well not that i was going to have a bad intention but he was just like here are the things that i believe yeah right and like and in just like the most loving way hmm. i respect you i respect myself and for a man to respect himself in a truly authentic way i don't think a lot of women have seen no um and so it's different than the guy being like the macho protector right and then that's it or um or even this idea that like well he just loves me and so we just can't help ourselves sort of thing right like or or, or the um uh, the, the word that's coming to my mind right now, which is not the most appropriate or clinical, is simp. The simps out there. Have you heard that term before? A simp? Yeah. Okay. Like the, the men who are, are deferential and don't have much confidence in themselves or backbones and um, basically the... Right, right. The woman walks all over him. Sure. Yeah. Or like... Or that's this... the most common today, I think. Mm, that's interesting. In the larger culture. Right, right, right. I, I could see that. Or even this idea that like... Um, well, you know, it's okay because he just loves me so much, right? Like mistreats you, not mistreats, but, but like, there's like a level, right? Like there are reasons why we believe what we believe going into marriage and even dating and all of that. And it's sort of like, um, often it can kind of get twisted into this, like, well, but we're on the path to marriage. And so it's, you know, it's okay. Mm. Greg held his ground, like in such a, um, a, such a beautiful way that was like there was um he he believed it for himself regardless of who was in that placeholder right of like you know future wife right like yeah. so he wasn't um, gonna bend he wasn't gonna bend and um and it showed me on the flip side that like he respected himself and that he would always then carry that towards me and yes. that that wasn't gonna that wasn't gonna move. How we treat others is how we treat ourselves is how we treat others. Those are deeply connected. And it it's like so impossible to see that acted out. Yeah. In, um, especially like in an early relationship, I think. So. Well, that's cool. It's really great. Yeah. So here we are. So it's so it feels less clinical. It doesn't feel like oh my gosh the psychoanalysis all the time. Your your relationship transcends that. Yeah, I mean sometimes it, um, be, I'm. Because I'm not a psychologist, mm. maybe it's like a beauty and ignorance, <laughs> right? Where sometimes he says things and I'm just like, knock it off. <laughs> I think you have to say that to people that do what I do and yeah. what Greg does. Yeah. You do. Yeah, it's very difficult to turn it off. Well, do you ever get rabbit holed? You just, you, there's one thing, let's say you and Teresa are talking about something. Uh-huh. And you're both analytical minds. And so you guys just start going down the rabbit hole. Of how whatever it is you're talking about, instead of just like lightheartedly, like, you know, can you throw in a load of laundry? Like, we haven't done laundry in three days, right? right. It's like, did you feel like maybe I wasn't helping you? Like, is there that kind of... Oh, for us, um, I'm pretty unskillful. <laughs> I need more of that. I need more. I need more rabbit holes. Oh, I need more rabbit holes. I think um, when we go down to a rabbit down a rabbit hole, it's two people that do what I do, going deep into something for at the benefit of one of us. Oh, okay. So it's like kind of like a a therapy session where we can create a safe space to explore deep parts of who we are. So that's beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Um, day to day, I I mean, I, if if there were, I mean, we actually do have cameras in our house, but I I imagine if people were just watching us day to day. Yeah. They wouldn't be like they're I mean maybe they would be like they're in mental health, but I I don't even know that they would. I don't know what they would. Really? Yeah, I mean I have parts of myself. Right. And even right, on right. even on this show, yeah. It's n I'm not in my therapist part right now. I mean uh I know. I mean look around like <laughs> I mean, I can imagine what people project even onto this imagery. Like right. if I'm in psychologist mode, I'm like I would probably make things more neutral, more welcoming. Maybe yeah. not put a demon behind my head. Right. That I, when I'm asking you to trust yeah. me, <laughs> you're like, I have a problem with cats. And meanwhile, I'm staring at like a, a demon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my guests generally, generally, at least so far, I have a very deep level of comfort with, and uh, you know, I can I can tease, I can bust chops, but you know, when you're working with someone in a clinical context, there's going to be a lot more sensitivity and gentleness around people's parts and, and the rawness of who they are. So, you know, this is much more of a fun part of Dr. Brian, not awesome. work, work mode Dr. Brian. Yeah. 
So I, in general, I try not to be work mode, Dr. Brian, unless someone's really asking for it or they're suffering. And, sure. I, and I, I mean, even that, it's, you know, people you love in your life, you can't, you can't help them. That's the hard part of what, what I do is you can only help people that are coming to you for help. So right. I may see people's problems in my family or um, amongst my friends, and I just kind of have to shut up and just be Brian instead of Dr. Brian, oh. even though it hurts. There's so many things in what you just said that I want to ask you about, actually. Go ahead. Um, well, the first thing is, it's interesting. Um, do you find it that even, you know, you said you can't help people unless they ask you, but I imagine too, that you probably I try anyway. <laughs> well, no, that you get asked sometimes like, well, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, you're, you're a psychologist. What do you think? Of, they're not going to take your advice anyway. Yeah. So even if they're asking for your help, right, it's like, you're never a prophet in your own town. There's a lot of that. I, I tell an ongoing joke uh, uh, about my mom where her and I were talking about, uh, I don't know what it was, but something about the way people are or something like that. Yeah. And she said something like, Brian, what they say is blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, mom, I'm they. <laughs> I'm not your child. Like, I'm the expert that you're referring I'm, to. I'm the person you're quoting. <laughs> like exactly, yeah. So, so, so there is there is a little bit of that. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, there's always projection. So mm-hmm. I think. I mean, not everybody in my family is is um, as devoted to the Catholic faith. So a lot of times there's projections onto me that I'm going to be critical or judgmental, when actually. Right. So they don't bring the issue to me because they're, right. they're anticipating that I'm going to have a certain kind of response when in reality... Well, you're like, I'm just judgmental even if I wasn't Catholic, right? Is that... <laughs> no, I actually... <laughs> listen, I am a mess, but one thing that I will pat myself on the back for is that I'm not critical. I'm not judgmental of people's choices. I'm not. I know. You I know. work on that because I'm, I'm such a mess and I've made so many mistakes that I just try to be like as merciful as I can on myself and so, so as to be merciful on other people. And that's what this ultimately, like this show, the spirit of this show is, look, you're on your own path to God. I'm, I'm not going to, like, I want to hear your perspective, your faith, your political persuasion, whatever it is. Come talk to me about it. Let's not shut down dialogue or conversation just because I have my own worldview. That's an interesting point. I find with uh, a lot of they's, a lot of you's, mm. you guys really like people. Whether you say, like, you know, there's that whole, thing. oh, I don't like people, oh, you know, da, 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 people. Oh, no, I'm but an extrovert. You really like people. You see the beauty in people, whether or not it's a beautiful presentation or not, right? There's always yeah. something underneath it. Um, I think Teresa's like that. Teresa's, like, super empathetic. Yeah, um, she is. Very empathetic. Uh, and Greg is like that, too. Like, sometimes I'm like, where, you know, this is, like, a complete disaster of yeah. a, a person or situation. And there's this, like, you know, there's so many layers to each person and he tends to see like still the most beautiful parts. Yeah. It's harder if the person's close to you and you're, you're being disappointed by them. Yes. <laughs> when there's your own emotional investment, that makes it way more challenging. Yeah. Um, the thing I was going to say about just going back to like a future career, I, um, I'm sure that's a skill set I could possibly learn, but it is not a natural thing for me or for many of my parts, I should say maybe, to um, to be super uh, empathetic. Um, me either. Yeah, but like... No, but me either. I'm great at challenging. I'm great at being direct and being authentic and saying, look, this is what I'm seeing. I'm, and a lot of clinicians have a hard time with that. They, yeah. they do a great job of creating this safe space, yeah. but they don't move their clients forward because they are scared to say the difficult thing. Yeah. I'm the other side where I Maybe can I, yeah. I can I can say what's hard, but I have to remember to slow down and be like build rapport. Right. <laughs> so when you say something, you don't sound like. Uh-huh. So you're you know? just not pummeling them. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah no. I and that's a, a skill that can be cultivated and developed. And even what you shared about Greg or Teresa's ability to go down to that deep level and see the beauty, yeah. no matter what's happening on the surface, that can be trained and developed as well, because in our work. You, you deal with people's defense mechanisms that are very challenging to sit with. I mean, I've been attacked by clients. I, my, my character has been attacked. Uh, I've been blamed for things. And I can't take that personal. So I have to learn how to see why this person is attacking me and what I represent to them. Can I take ownership over some of that? Like you learn to find, like we love everybody. 
we make that distinction. Do I, I love them, but do I like them? We talked about that with our yeah. family oftentimes. But you can even learn how to find things you like about every person. Because when you remove the self, the defense mechanisms and gain access to their true self. Every, it's always beautiful. Yeah. Every defense mechanism is, is boring. I mean, it's predictable. It's the same. There's a certain closed set of defense mechanisms that are apparent across right. different people. There, te- a lot of them are just textbook. Right, like, right, right, right. Or combinations of defenses. Sure. But there's only so much you can learn about it. And it's predictable. But the person is unique, unique. and yeah. interesting and never boring. Right. So with those, there's no matter how thick someone's defenses are, you can like, oh, there you are. You could see that even part of them. Even if it's a blip. Yeah, even if it's a blip, yeah. and you feel like, oh, and that's like, it's like a drop of water in a desert. It's like sometimes. the thing that keeps you going. It is. It is. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like if you know you're gonna, you might, if you pull that lever one more time, you might get the jackpot. Yeah. You, you know it's possible. Well, that's a hard part too is you just have to trust because it's, yeah. you know, the clinical work can go like this. It's not linear. You have to be patient and wait for the next moment where you're connecting with someone. You don't know when that's going to be because they have their free will, their own choices. Right. And you hope that you create a space safe enough where trust is built and they'll allow you access to, to more raw or more uh, impained parts of themselves. But you never know when that's going to happen. Life is tough, right? <laughs> Life is tough, yeah. Life is really tough. But I think you could do it. I think you'd be fantastic. And not just you could do it, but I think you'd be fantastic. Thank you. I mean, maybe by the time it's the kids are out, you'll have your fill of psychology. <laughs> you whatever want to do it again. No. Anything like that. But I, you know, I've always thought you'd be great at what I do. I, I will say, uh, and this is comes from a, a place of humility, but I do, there are definitely um, things that are easier for me, right? I can, it's very easy for me to see a defense mechanism. You're very insightful. You read people very well. Right. Reading someone is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, or, you know, there's like a, usually a gut instinct, right? Like it's very easy for me to just take parts and, and sometimes to my detriment, like make it, you know, make it a story. So to be very discerning, right? Cause you start to take parts of what you believe and then all of a sudden you can build a story that's not accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not usually wrong, though. I'm not when it comes to that, right? Yeah. No, I know what you mean. But if my uh, lack of empathy gets in the way, that kind of thing, um, then that just could derail. So that so that's tricky. It's interesting that that can be a learned skill set. But yeah, it's I basically the antidote to narcissism. It's very simple. There's narcissism all over our, our culture right Everywhere. now, yeah, and it's something that people commonly struggle with. But the antidote to narcissism is empathy. It's a very simple equation. You want to learn how to be less narcissistic? Think about what's going on inside of someone else. Put yourself yeah. in their shoes. And the more you do that, the less your narcissistic defenses will, right. will you know, drive the bus. And e- even narcissistic defenses, like underneath them, there is a part that is good that's you know, desiring excellence or desire to... Uh, uh, Love. To, yeah, well, of course. At the bottom, it's all right, love right, for everybody. Right, right. There's different flavors for different types. But in any event, um, empathy is the answer. It's really the answer for everything. So you can you can learn that. It's not even about learning it. It's it's natural, actually. When you calm down that part that is preventing you from seeing other people, right? then you're, the empathy is just going to well up within you. Yeah. Right, right. It's just a... Sure. Um. I did want to talk to you about, you made a, uh, you were talking about you and Greg and you were talking about how you emphasize uh, humor sometimes and a, a lightness sure. and a humor. And I wanted to talk to you about humor. And we briefly touched upon this recently when we went out to dinner together and how um, we're both always kind of looking for the joke and yeah. how that is not always healthy. <laughs> I, I You hear this when you listen to uh, comedians, right? Like there's a new... Uh, movement within the world of comedy where you're getting the behind the scenes look at what it's like to be a comedian, what their relationships are like with one another. Sure. And it's not just the comedy show. It's right. what, who are, and I can identify and I'm, I'm not as, you know, I'm, I'm no Dave Chappelle over here, but I can identify with always looking for the joke. Yeah. No matter how dark or difficult it is. Right. And like, you know, my own trauma, my own history, like we had some dark times. And one of the ways that we got through that was humor. Yeah. And it was, it helped me then, but 
as is the case with most defense mechanisms, it was appropriate then, but doesn't yeah. mean it's always appropriate now, especially if you don't have the flexibility to not be funny when someone isn't looking for a right. joke. So um, <laughs> I don't know if there's a question here, but what do you what do you what do you think about this about mis oh boy. misuse of humor? Yeah, uh, it's hard to to in my mind, it's hard to misuse humor. Um, I mean, and I know that sounds really terrible. Uh, yeah, that's something that people who aren't funny say that you're misusing humor. Right. <laughs> Yeah, let's victim blame. But, let's um, but, let's victim. Let's just get it out there. That was a joke. If you, <laughs> um, right. So, yes, right. It's it's really hard, especially if your mind's working fast, right? Yeah. Um, to not only grab the joke and be able to put it in where it belongs without the Timing. conversation to rolling rolling on right past it, and then you have to be like, "But that was really funny." Let's you can't go back. Yes. And at the same time... To let it go. You may never have that moment for that oh, joke again. So bad. That's right. hard. It's really hard. No one will ever laugh at this really funny thing in my head. And it might be comedic genius. <laughs> um, and genius on so many... Like, it might be so interconnected. But also, uh, this... Um, you also have to be able to... Uh, be able to grab what's going on, piece it all together, and then figure out... Is it like, is it appropriate in the group that you're in, right? And not just is it appropriate, but like, is that person going to be able to handle it? Sometimes the answer is no. And you only find out because you did it anyway. I actually don't care about that part. That part I don't what? care about. I, I'm not saying you're wrong. But for me, I think that... <laughs> I think Say it. Say it, because you're thinking the same thing no, I'm thinking. I think people need to lighten up. The and I think there's parts of them that, even if outwardly they, they may resist the joke, there's parts of them that think that it's funny. Of course, but, but some people like to hold on to the part of them for whatever reason that's like, now, but I'm going to make a big deal about the fact that you made this joke because that's their part that yes. wants attention or yes. that wants whatever. Right, so you didn't want to say it, but I was, and I didn't want to say it, <laughs> but I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, people. I think people need to lighten up, and I think generally my personality is to push into places of discomfort. You know, they, you know, they say, you know, they talk about like, this is this. <laughs> now I'm like, I shouldn't say this on air. <laughs> the analogy I was going to make was, you know, how during 9-11, this is yeah. dark oh, humor. Oh, here we go. Here we go. You know, during 9-11 afterwards, they're like real heroes run towards danger, not away from danger. Right. Like they're talking about yeah. firefighters. That's, sure. that's the context of this, which is true. And also... This is dark. Right? Right. This, is, yep. this is a very dark topic, not to minimize any the tragedy of 9-11. I have to say that. Right. But a, another comedian, I wouldn't have to say that to. Like, of course 9 Of course 9-11 is terrible, right? Right. And, and, but the joke is like, that's that's like, I'm like, I'm a hero of comedy. Like, I'm a hero. Like, I, to... I, run, I run towards the, the, the danger. I run towards the thing that yeah. makes people uncomfortable. But in reality, that's true, not even in humor for me. That's, I think that's why I can do what I do. So sure. I, I'm the kind of person that at a funeral, I'm not like nervous to get in the, in the line. Right. Like, I'm like, I'm walking up to the, the person grieving and I'm like, how you doing? Like, you know, like yeah. I go towards the emotional distress and discomfort. That's why I'm good at challenging. Not empathy, but I'm better at challenging because right. I'm not scared of scared of awkwardness yeah. or discomfort. Yeah. So that means that I I can live in that space for humor as well. I'm just thinking about what you said, and I'm thinking like when you're saying like people need to lighten up. It's not because just like what you're saying about 9/11. It's implied unless you're a complete psychopath that 9/11 was horrific. Or they don't. Or they don't. But they don't know me. Maybe they think. Right, but the but the idea is just benefit of the doubt. You're a normal, run of the mill person. Yeah, you don't think nine eleven was hysterical. You think it was horrific. Right. That being implied, there is a level of detachment yes. from the tragedy. Yes. That you can then find like something right. Some. So, I just gotten. Can I find the joke in something terrible, and they're and they're. Like, I mean, this this is like Viktor Frankl. Right, you know Viktor Frankl, mm -hmm. Man's Search for Meaning. Yep. He's like, I'm in a concentration camp, but you know what? There's beauty and joy in life here. Yep. It's awful. I'm not saying it's not awful. He's not like, let's sign everyone up for this. Right. 
Exactly. Right. Right. But I can find some moment of lightness, some brevity, and some connection. That's what I think you can find that humor in darker moments. It's not to take away from the darkness, but let's find a little bit of hope. To both and. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think I think no matter what, whenever you put yourself out there, there's going to be people who like what you have to say and those who don't. I mean, this is a the show. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's going to be people that absolutely hate me, that, think, that villainize me. Yeah. They're going to cancel me. Yeah. Cancel you from watching this. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. You know. Guitar. Yeah. Um, and then there's some people that get it. And so, right. like. And we like those people. Those are the people that we like. But we, we love everyone. <laughs> um, hopefully, the, you know, people would, ne- uh, would, would see me on this show saying things that are mean slash funny, teasing, that, and they don't think that that's reflective of my care for them in a clinical context. Of but, course not. But yeah. like just in the same way, and this is probably going to get some people riled up, but here I'm, I'm going to go down this path anyway. With it's the Pope cough Francis, drop. You're on a cough drop. Go ahead. You know, it's not my fault. I'm on the, I'm on, I'm on the cough drop. Um, for instance, let's say Pope Francis aside, any Pope that said, maybe makes a comment. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's taken out of context... Sure. Right. People get really can get really fired up about it. Right. But the bottom line is like, let's go from the assumption that the Pope is Catholic. Right. Yeah. So it's the same idea. Like, let's go from the assumption that you are a good person who got into this field because you actually want to help people. Sure. That you know what your own personal trauma and wounds are. Yeah. And that that's not always fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That you found humor in that. Yeah. And that you're not here to, um, you're not here for destruction. That's basically what this show is. I mean, if, if someone sits there and says something that's in conflict with the Catholic position, mm-hmm. and I don't correct them, it's not because you're agreeing. Right. I'm. I want to create space for them to share what what their perspective is. And but I could see how someone else observing me in a, in dialogue would be like, oh, he's not even Catholic. Right. <laughs> but I am. <laughs> I promise. And that's the idea. Like you go from a place assuming that like whether I think things are funny or there can be humor or that something, one thing I really love is how things get are connected, right? Like two totally different things can be connected back together whenever you're talking. Like I was thinking about you saying, um, you know, there's a lot of projection. You're like, I've been I've been attacked by clients. It can be very unpredictable. And I was thinking like, that's just what you said about cats. <laughs> right and so like yes there's um so you this is, you, this is you trying to convince me of the beauty of cats right now right so then right, <laughs> if so you then, can do it with clients right so then you started saying like but at the core you know like you might not like that part but like you could still love them you can still see and i'm thinking to myself like i almost cut yeah, you but off. doesn't this go back to you needing other people to like what you like there's just the connection there okay that's all it is <laughs> i just want you to see the connection oh thank you i see it now Um, speaking do of, with it what you will. Okay. Listen, speaking of not being Catholic, uh-huh. um, you weren't, and I don't, <laughs> I, and I don't, I don't really know much about that, to be honest. Uh, I know you had a, a, a conversion experience. This was, so twice. what's the difference between Greg and Jesus? You know, nothing. <laughs> I mean, no, but th- this is actually, a, uh, I think a legitimate line of inquiry where, yeah. People in a relationship, <laughs> one of them is Catholic, one of them right. is not, and then there's a conversion, and during that process, they have to sort through, like, is this because I I love this person, or am I do I have my own unique relationship with God, and that's the reason that's motivating me? Right. Like, I, there's probably a tension in there, right? I mean, you tell me. Are you saying, like, if I wasn't drawn into the church from Jesus, why would I, why was I drawn into the church via Greg? I didn't. Oh, that's I mean, not. I didn't you're... mean to frame it oh, that way. Oh, oh. We could frame it that way. I mean, just like, what is the experience like? Of like, can you imagine being Catholic without Greg? Like, what? Oh, I like... was Catholic without Greg. Oh, I thought you converted after two you two times. Oh, you converted twice. They say third time's a charm. I'm trying not to do that. Okay. Um. So I wasn't baptized until I was 15, and when I was, um, I was baptized, confirmed, uh, and all of that at um, Easter Vigil when I was 15. Oh. So wait, why? Yeah, so um, so my parents had gone through a divorce when I was little. My mom um, had gotten remarried. Uh, she married a cradle Catholic 
and through her um, and him going through like the annulment process, right, for his first marriage and her first marriage, um, she she has her own set of everything. Um, but she really started, um, she found a home in the church. Uh huh. I have my own opinion on that. This, but this, but from a 15 year old perspective, this was modeled for you in some way. Like it was like, it was like a lifeline for her to cling to because she has so much trauma. Right. So she found a place like a little child, mm-hmm. right. Which is kind of what we're called to do. And if anything saves her, it will be that child's that like internal child, right? Well, maybe. Well, we hope. I mean, or you, you mean you no, have I don't mean hopes. that she, you have I don't hopes. mean that she won't be saved. I mean <laughs> that like whether or not someone's saved is beyond is no, above my but, pay grade and um, God alone judges the heart and No, but what I mean is like <laughs> there is yeah, no, that what I mean is there is there she has so much trauma and there's so many there's so many problems but but if there's anything in there that is beautiful from all of this bad. It's like that desire. Like she may not be like a perfect mom. You can see that desire. You can see that she may not be a, she's not a perfect mom, but what she has is at least the desire to be loved like a daughter. That's beautiful. And if there's anything, right, that's hard for a daughter to say about her mom. But, um, but if there's any like truly redeeming, like something there, it's, that she's so broken um, and that all she wants is to be loved, right? Mm. And, like, if that's all you got at the end of the day... I mean, that's all I got at the end of the day. Then, right? So, in any case, it was sort of modeled. It was just sort of, like, presented. And at 15, you know, my parents had gone through a divorce and my mom's... And so, you know, you're... And at 15, just in general, things are kind of, like... Right? So, but I saw I thought it was really beautiful. And then I did um, camp every summer at Catholic U for a week. It was just like a service camp. And um, as much as empathy can be hard for me, like service is big on my list, Mm. right? And I think that is really like where my heart can be. And so um, I just thought like, what's better than this? Mm. Um, And so I just went, you know, my sister and I just like went full on. Um, We were baptized and confirmed together. Um, And and then, you know, I kind of saw how my mom was sort of living it. And I thought... Mm. this isn't really in line with like, I mean, I wasn't a theologian, but like with like what I thought everyone was preaching. Yeah. Um, and, and, and because service is close to my heart, um, the part of our faith that, um, is really into social justice and true social justice, um, it was like, there's no compassion in this house. It's just all like, follow the rules, follow the rules of the church. The church teaches this and we have no, there is no room outside of this box for like a real human experience. And I thought, I'm not interested in that. Like, I don't, if that's what Catholic means, mm. I'm not into that. Right. Um, and then my sister died. Mm. And then I thought, well, forget this. Like we were down this path together. You know, we were baptized and confirmed together. We did Catholic camp together. We did youth group together. And I thought, now I'm just out in the world alone. I can't trust my, you know, my parents' version of Catholicism. Yeah. And then now my sister's not here. So like, forget this. And so um, I was just really turned off. How long did that last? So that lasted from, I think I was probably... Uh, like 18 around my sister died when I was 18 so I would say like that's sort of you know I was kind of like this isn't quite like what I'm into maybe a little bit before that you know really getting into high school and some of like the bigger questions like abortion sure blah, blah. Um, I went to college I totally renounced it I was like this is I mean I would have if you asked me I don't think I would have said atheist but I was a strong agnostic right let me ask you during that phase of your life mm-hmm. Looking back now, yeah, can you see evidence of God calling to you? And uh, are we, were, you, were you having <laughs> were you having like transcendent kinds of experiences through other mediums besides explicit Catholic faith? Yeah. So if uh, if you, there's anything, I am I can be really dense, and God <laughs> just comes with like a, you know a good frying pan. Yes. Um. And so when He's showing me something, He shows me like, you know. So it's very explicit. It's very explicit, and mm. so. 
I had a, um, a professor just, you know, looking back on it now, I'm like, you know, she just said like, I know you're struggling. It was like a science class and I like never attended. My sister had just died. I was just going to college. And, uh, she just said, why don't you just close the books and just go sit in the chapel? And I was like, that's so stupid. (laughs) (laughs) No. Um, but like it, I mean, I've never forgotten that. And I don't, I couldn't even, I can't even picture her face. Mm. Um, but that like feeling, right. It's just like, well, the invitation, the invitation was, and I didn't do it. Yeah. And then Kanye West was on the rise when I was in college, right? And Jesus Walks Jesus just walks. loaded. That's a great song. And it was almost like, it's a beautiful song. And I, um, you know, it hit me so hard, but it's one of those things that hits you that you're like, I'll come back to that mm. because I know what you're doing, but I'm not interested. God? I'm interested. Yeah. Or Kanye. No, no. Oh, Kanye, I've never not been interested. <laughs> Um, God, I was like, I know what you're doing, right? Kanye's going to blow up. I mean, he, he was like right on the, yeah. and it just, he just, you know, now anyway, he has his own struggles, but, um, it was always there. And I, and it, so the science teacher and Kanye, uh, what and, else is there? Well, what else? <laughs> I mean, that's my question. <laughs> is there anything else? Do you have, like, cause I just love, I love the implicit God, you know, I love when we discover him in a mysterious way and you're mm-hmm. kind of not quite sure, but you can feel the call. You know it's there. You know it's there, but it's not, it, you know, it's, you know, God is calling me, calling to me to this Captain America comic book. Like, I've, like you, you're not sure, but there's something extra about it. There's something almost like quasi-mystical yeah. and like it doesn't quite make sense. There's, it's like clouded. Mm-hmm. But then if you, if you start to live your faith later, you're like, oh, oh that yeah. was part of this larger story. It's cool because... When I met Greg, I had I was only dating Jewish guys, right? <laughs> I mean, right. Um, I wish we had more time. <laughs> well, the, I mean, just the very, very basics is like, generally speaking, and please don't don't crucify me if I'm completely wrong, but like, a lot of my friends were Jewish, right? Like, I, I, there was a there was a lot of um, reform Judaism mm-hmm. that was happening in my life, and a yeah. lot of it. It's like the here and now. And it's attractive because it's like that sort of social justice. Like, what are we believing now? Like, who are we helping now? Yeah. Not later. Not like, just do your best and maybe you'll make it to heaven. It was really beautiful. And what I saw with Catholicism was like, I'm not interested in that. So in any case, uh, Greg and I met online and I happened to glance over part of his online profile that said, Catholic, my faith is very important to me. It was there. It was probably bold letters. <laughs> it was probably the only thing that was written there. It was yellow high- highlight. It was yellow <laughs> highlight. Um, and I, you know, I didn't see that. But um, Greg was uh, in a certain point, too, where he had been dating Catholic people and was just like, or Catholic women, and was just like, something is also missing. So, yeah. like, you can have the recipe, but you need more than just, like, you need if you need a recipe for chicken... Mm. You need more than just the chicken, right? Yes. You need more than the chicken. So yes. You need salt, you need pepper. Like, you need stuff to cook the chicken, right? I'm not even into recipes, but that's another topic. But you know that. Yeah. Yes. So Greg had the chicken, but he didn't have all the other stuff. And I was lacking the chicken, but I had all these other things. So, in any case, um, when we hadn't even met in person, we had talked maybe like a couple times. I was headed to Miami. He was headed to Haiti. And we thought, like, when we get back, um, we'll go out for a drink. And so in Miami, I called my friend and I said, uh, you're not going to believe this because I'm not into God. But I'm going to marry Greg. Hmm. And I said, I haven't met him in person. Yeah. But I know that because I heard you're going to marry him, like mm. go through my head. And yeah, it, and I yeah. was like, that's ridiculous. I was like, you know, as well as I do, right. I don't, I don't believe that that just like, I don't believe in that. Yes. But all of my doubt was gone. It's okay. He believes in you. God. Believe- <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it was another one of those things. It just like, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, 
humble enough to listen. I asked Greg a lot of questions. His answers were true, good, and beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, like, there's a certain point where, like, you have to just give in and um, your pride has to leave, right? Like, sometimes you're wrong. Sure. Did you have anyone uh, expressing concern that you're only doing this religious thing because of Greg? No. I mean, no. Um, or because maybe people didn't care what you were doing. <laughs> no. No. Um, so my parents were so glad because they were like, oh, look, you know, they're like this... Good guy. They're crazy Catholics, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so they're that they were hopeful. And then my friends who were atheist, really, really, really liberal. Um, I don't know if it's part of their particular philosophy and liberalism to not tell me that I should or shouldn't do something. Mm. Um, or if it's my particular personality that wouldn't necessarily put up with that. Hmm. Or their own particular fears. People are scared of you. <laughs> um, or their own particular like fears of like I'm touching something that they're not ready to touch, right? It's like an, it's the, you mean an, at a an deep, internal. at a unconscious yeah, at a deep, level? Right, like at a deep level for their own personal thing. Yeah. But we, all, we just lost touch. That's too bad. That's another yeah. question I was going to ask you. Do you have any, I mean, I know, I know in recent years you've had a couple non-Catholic friends, but anyone from that time period? No, no. No. Uh -uh. Do you miss that? There are things I miss. What do you miss about not be about... What do you miss... <laughs> now that you're Catholic, <laughs> what do you miss about the life you had when you were not Catholic? The sin. <laughs> I mean, that's it, right? We sin now, so that doesn't count. Yeah. But like, is there is there something that like was there? I mean, because this could probably unlock some important things for you, because if you are if you are thinking about experiences you had then that you miss, yeah, that you're dissociating disassociating from what is Catholic, there's probably a way that you could baptize those experiences and bring them into some a, of them a Catholic fold. Sure. Yeah. Sure. What do I miss? Um, I, I do miss the heart of those people that I was close to, right? Because despite having like wildly different viewpoints, just like we were talking, I know the self in those people and I know their actual hearts and what their desires are. And because I've been on the other side, right, like extremely liberal, mm. um, this is not a war between uh, hu like people, right? This is like a war about I Well, I don't ideas. even know that it's a war between Catholics and liberals. It's a war of ideas. I mean, there's, I mean, <coughs> I, I do want, I, I do want to make the point though that like being Catholic doesn't mean that you're a Republican. No, 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 no. But there are certain, there are certain truths like abortion's wrong. Sure. Uh, there, yes. There are Catholic values and Catholic belief systems sure. that coincide with particular issues right. along the political spectrum. But right. once upon a time... The most Catholic place to be was to be a Democrat. Of course, you know, right. and uh, you know the, right. the 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 political spectrum has shifted, but the Catholic faith is what it is, which is independent of the political spectrum. Right. And you could say that there are uh, aspects of um, conservatism, yeah, that are not very Catholic, and I would probably align myself more from a Catholic perspective with with something like serving the poor, emphasizing serving the poor, for sure. example. So. Right. I, I try to make the distinction because yeah, I yeah. think there's there's often a pairing between being conservative and being Catholic, and they can, those can work together, but I don't know that they need to always end in all cases. Even thinking back to the um, like you had just mentioned, our most recent friends, right, who are atheists, but very um, politically conservative, hmm. uh, which was an odd mix for Greg and I because so it's like the opposite. It was like the opposite, yeah. and we were like, you guys are really on the right track um but from a catholic perspective from a on the right on the right track from a catholic perspective yeah the right track from like a truth perspective right there are people watching this show who are not catholic right but there's a but there is but there is, but right but as a catholic i believe that we have the fullness of truth and it's really yes. beautiful when i see that people have truth they're like on that right and you just haven't like 
charge through whatever that wall is. I really believe that once you get through the wall, you realize like, yes. wait a minute, this is actually... Totally. All I'm saying that that in and of itself is a Catholic perspective. <laughs> <laughs> right. In any case, it was like just one or two links was missing, right? Mm. And they couldn't quite grasp like where their missing links were. Mm. Um, and... Uh, so in any case, it's kind of, it was an, an odd combination, right? Yeah, Sometimes. so here you have someone that's uh, conservative and a Republican, but doesn't have the faith part, the faith part of it. Lacking the faith. It, it's just illustrating yes. that there is a distinction between politics and religion. And morally hmm. on the same page. Hmm. Very much morally on the same page. It's fascinating. Very fascinating. Hmm. Um, in any case, um, so what do I miss? So I miss the heart of those people. Um, I miss concerts. Do you? Yeah, like concert festivals. Like I would go for like three days and like... Why? Because with like without responsibility or you miss it because... What do you miss about it? Uh, I think I miss... I mean, that's part of it. Probably not res- like the, the freedom to just get up and go... Yeah, and not <laughs> come back. And not come back for three yeah. days. <laughs> to go on an adventure with, with close friends whom I just like part of the... Re- the <laughs> The part of the reason I'm doing this show is so I can hang out with people yeah. that, that I don't see anymore. Right. You know, it gives them an excuse. So not seeing them, just the 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 ability to engage in music in a in a different way, like like an untethered. I, well, yeah, and I mean, I made music God for myself. Ah. I made music God for myself, and uh, that's not good, right? And I've since changed. So where now God is God for me, and I can see music in the light of my spiritual perspective. Yeah. But there was something comforting about being wrong. Like there was, oh. there was an emotional resonance with the right lyric or, you know, when, when the song hits you just right. And like, there was something emotionally comforting about the musical experience that I had then that okay. I don't have anymore. Oh. Like I'm not like, I'm always thinking about things like through a redemptive, uh, Lens. Lens, right. I mean, it was almost like the divine was, seemed to me to be actually be a little bit more accessible in my emotional life through music then. Yeah. Th- Whereas now when God, t- sometimes I'm like, God, what about this? And he's like, and doesn't answer me. <laughs> Whereas yeah. like, I could pop in a song and feel something. I mean, but spirituality that's connected? is not emotional. Spirituality is not emotional. It can be. But right? you can't let that dictate your spiritual life. No, but I do find like okay, we went to Italy for two months. Sure. With the kids, um, and one thing because we were living in um, in cities, one thing we didn't have was a, like a ton of freedom to play music, right? And I wasn't driving in the car all the time and listening to religious music, um, even like even like Christian pop. Mm-hmm. That gave me like a really kind of. Um, like a pretty profound like desolation in some sense. Like I felt really disconnected because we were going to mass, we're going to daily mass, right? And like there is an objective reality of like I'm receiving the Eucharist and I am I'm there, right? Um but the feeling isn't always there, which right doesn't all even if I am listening to it, it's not always there, right? But <clears throat> I find that for me, I hear a lot of what God's trying to tell me through music. Same. And so that's, that's what I'm an saying. Interesting perspective, now, though. No, now I'm in a, I'm in a like I'm in a different place where like that's more typical of what you're saying. Like I right. experienced God through music at times. Yeah. But when music was God, okay. it felt like I had a closer proximity. Like this is all unconscious. I wasn't thinking this at the time. But I'm like looking back, like comparing these two experiences. Then I felt like I had more access to the spiritual life because if the spiritual life is only emotion, and you I can, can manipulate and control way. emotion, it's like now it's like I have to deal with. God being silent sometimes or even if you turn on the music even it right exactly because you're like exactly yeah ah. so so uh it's a it's a healthier real relationship sure you know it's like it's there was an immaturity to that like the world isn't built around my feelings right but for a child it is yeah and so there's an immaturity in that so but I do miss like you know it's in the same way it's like I you miss mi- the junk food yeah and I think in the same way I miss uh, you know, playing on the playground as if the only thing that mattered like was the monkey bars and yeah. life hadn't hurt me yet. Yeah. And the innocence of that, like there's something about that experience which was easier. But Christian, the Christian life is hard. 
it's better. It's more rewarding. It's deeper. It's more meaningful. Right. But it, it um, it's hard. It's really hard. <clears throat> um, yeah. I mean, what are you working on in yourself right now? Um, Psychologically, spiritually. Gosh. What am I working on in myself right now? Um, I mean, how much time do you have? As long as you need. No, I was hoping you were going to be like, yep, no, we're good. <laughs> um, this isn't even that hard. I have a follow-up question that's going to be harder than this one. So well, hit me with that. What's the thing that you're not working on? that you need to work on. That's the second thing that's down the road that you're putting off. Oh gosh. You know what? Self-discipline. <laughs> okay. Self -discipline. You, you know that. Okay. Self-discipline. Yeah. Cause it shows up like this in my face every day. <laughs> that is self-discipline for, for me. Um, every day. And there would be so many pieces that would fall into place if I practiced true self-discipline. Yeah. Um, it's not even that hard. I just, there's some type of block there right now and I can't quite figure out like, um, where it is. Um, a part of you that's like, meh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Meh, I'll treat myself. Meh. Yeah, and I... So self-discipline is the is the higher level thing. Yeah. What am I working on? In you know what? The, I... Uh, this sound, maybe this sounds so abstract. I'm working on the space between something... The bullets in our fire fight. That song reminds me of my sister so much. <laughs> Really? It's so, it's such a beautiful, yeah, because like when you're little, you're that close in age, we're like 14 months apart Yeah. and you go through so many little, you know, like it brings you together at the same time, you know, like little sis, we're sisters or siblings or you fight. Yeah. So, um, but it's like, she's going to be like, she's there. Like that's what we're kind of in that weird, right? Anyway, mm. anyway, that's, well, that's off topic. No, no. I mean, it's, but we can, we can make it on topic very easily because we were just talking about God reaching to us through music and how yeah. that is the beautiful thing about music is that yeah. it gets underneath our conscious defenses, right. pulls up our unconscious. I mean, I pretty much only cry when I'm watching a movie <laughs> or listening to a song these days. And when someone, when someone dies, someone died in my life recently, I, I have a, I have a go-to song oh. that allows me to grieve it like pulls things out of me you want to uh blink 182 it's not adam's song it, i miss you oh yeah yeah it's a deep song where are you like, yeah. where are you and i miss you and don't... oh grace is gone i think about that with dave matthews for my sister that's a great song too it's a good one it's yeah good. the space between yeah the thing the comment or the, um, I can, ha I have like a, I tend to have like some sensory, uh, sensitivities, the sensory sensitivity, right. Which is for me, very, it's a, it's very purgative living in a house with a dog and seven little kids and a husband. And, um, we are constantly having people in and out of the house. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> People working on the house because we love to do fixer uppers. Um, I mean, it's you know, there's a lot there. So um, that sensory thing for me, um, and my reaction to whatever it is, very hard. I think the excuse is, well, my brain works fast, and so I quickly react. Um, it's not very. It doesn't hold a lot of water um, <laughs> at home. <laughs> Or just in general. So, so I mean, you're I'm talking about. So you're talking about learning how to inhibit more. Not inhibit so much as that, like, being able to. Pro I'm I'm a slow processor, so it's easier for me to react fast, go back, process whatever it was. For instance, okay, it should not be so abstract. We sit down to dinner, and Greg says, oh, "I need a glass. Can you know? I got to get a glass of water." Oh, what? Oh, I'm just having, tr oh, is the chicken dry? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm, s yeah, I didn't want the chicken to be dry, <laughs> but, right? You asked him, you know. <laughs> and is he allowed to say an objective truth or whatever? Of course. Like, yes. is it objectively true the chicken is dry or that he would per particularly like salt on it? Or maybe he wants hot sauce on the thing that I didn't believe needed hot sauce. Are those all, is that, of course. 
So I'm working on the space between like what that sounds for my parts. Yes. And what the other person is objectively, their objective right to their own feelings. Yes. And how, what that means for me. Well, I mean, there's, I think there's more, more to it than even that. So, so there's your, what your perception is, there's what their feelings are. And then there's sometimes like in this case where it wasn't even an emotional expression on Greg's part. It's just like the chicken is dry fact. It's not Mm -hmm. his feelings about chicken being dry, going back to his childhood. It's not about you cooking (laughs) the chicken and you're not making like whatever. It's just an observation of fact. It's like, uh, my wife and I, sometimes there's moments when I'll walk into a room and I'll say, wow, it's a mess in here. Oh, don't even. But do you know what I mean? I I mean... You love Teresa? No. <laughs> I, all I You don't mean, even mean anything about Teresa. No. Right. I'm saying it's a mess in here. Because it's an objective truth. It's an objective truth. I'm not saying it's your fault it's a mess in here. You made the mess. You bought too many toys. Why haven't you cleaned the mess? You bought too many toys. Uh-huh. I'm literally saying like... You didn't train our kids right because our kids can't pick up after themselves. It's yet. your job. <laughs> None your of job. that. None of that. No, in fact, like if I go into that, like how to solve the problem, yeah. then it's like, what can I do to help? Like, can I do... Should I clean the... Like, yeah. what's go, should we think systematically about what goes into the messy room? Like, I'm not even there yet. And, I'm just saying the room is a mess. And even if you were... You're not saying, I'm doing this because you can't, Teresa, because you're not capable. Or. Or you don't know how to have a or, system. Or, even if that's true, I'm not saying I don't love you. Or that Ma- you're not a good person. You're not worth it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you don't have what it takes to keep a clean house. But it doesn't mean I don't love you. I don't have what it takes to do, to run by schedule. And can I just tell you, the striving, the amount of striving energy... <laughs> That it takes for Greg to accept that. (laughs) Not for me to do it. I just. But even if he has frustration over your inability to do that, that still does not touch whether or not he loves you. Greg loves me so much. Love is not earned. This is the most common problem I have in all my clinical work. Love is not earned. is, Is the belief that I earn my love. Yeah. Am I smart enough, good looking enough? Yeah. Can I keep a schedule? Yeah. Whatever it is, whatever secondary characteristic. It's, it, and this is so easy to explain when you think about your kids. Like, no yeah. matter what they do, no matter how they screw, them, screw sure. up, you may want them to live well. So, so you, you train them to live sure. well. You parent them. Right. But even if they don't, oh. you're upset because you love them. Yeah. It doesn't threaten the love. It, they're, yeah. they're, they're different things. Completely different. Greg loves me so much. He will take so much time well, this is not only his love for me because he wants me to have peace. He think, he believes that if we run a little bit more on schedule, I'll you have, will have peace. peace. He's right about that. There's also a part of him, right, that must run on schedule for his own, right? So it's a little beneficial for himself too, but he's not, you know, he's not like so saintly. But anyway... No, he loves me so much that he will just grab a notebook and he'll, like, we just had a family meeting the other day about schedule and he didn't say anything. He wasn't like, well, since your mom's not doing this, you know. Um, yeah. In any case. Yeah, no, there, um, I, what I am working on myself, gosh, this is tangential, um, is to to separate out that thing um, and process. I need processing time. And I'm trying to get faster at processing Hmm. so that even if my initial gut reaction is like, I might even say it, let's say to Greg, what it sounds like you're saying to me, and I know you don't mean this, you know you don't, because I I know you, is that I ran so poorly on schedule today and decided to not do this that I overcooked the chicken. I know that you're not saying that, but that's what it sounds that's like. To so me right many now. steps removed from the chick. I can I have a glass of water. <laughs> and I just, I'm very like I'm a very verbal person, and so I, yeah. I will say that, and and I'll say I know it's your right to say that the chicken is dry, and that you're not. But part of me needs to hear at least right now, as I'm trying to grow that space, for you to say that you're not judging me because of the chicken. And Greg will say. I'm not judging you because of the chicken. And I'll be like, great. 
Thanks. Here's your water. Here's your water. Mary Poppins. Let's do it. Poppins. We're going to pop right in to Mary, I... to Mary Poppins. You had almost had a panic attack when I asked you to choose a movie. And you said you don't like movies. <laughs> you know, I heard. I, I met all your parts. You heard I don't that. Like, That's I don't, what you heard. I don't like movies. I don't have opinions on movies. I don't like to talk about movies. And then you're like, fine, Mary Poppins. Uh, <laughs> which I watched no. for, for the first time ever last night. All right. Let me put a quick disclaimer. I, I have trouble with my attention span watching an entire movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I have watched some movies. I've watched many movies. Usually I fall asleep. I have a new rule. New method? New rule. I don't take the kids to the movies anymore because I fall asleep in the middle of the day and I get a headache and mom's not fun at the movies. Mom is fun building catapults. I take them fishing. Yeah. Uh, I play wiffle ball. Greg sure. takes the kids to the movies. Okay. I do like movies. I like The Sound of Music. And I like Mary Poppins, both Julie Andrews. But the most exciting thing about this conversation is going to be the fact that you hadn't seen it. Never saw it. I am dying to Mm. know anything about anything you want to talk about about the movie, any of your opinions, any of your connections, and so specifically... Um, the, I think the end of the movie, but I could be, I could be, I'm really interested to hear what, what you have to say. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, as a child, let me start by saying this. I never saw this film because as a child, I liked Disney cartoons and I was like, this is a serious grown up movie. It's like a chitty chitty bang bang. It's like, yeah. A, yeah. And there are cartoons in this, but it felt like it wasn't. You yeah. know, Robin Hood or Sword in the Stone or any of yeah. those Disney films I saw as a kid. So I never really got around to it. Um, and then upon watching it, it's kind of an adult film. Oh, definitely. There's a lot of adult themes. There's a lot of adult language exchange that a kid wouldn't no. understand. Which is in... talking about finance in England and sure. like, yeah. yeah. So so it's not a kid's movie, I don't think. It can be whimsical. It's whimsical. Yes. But it's definitely it, it's really deep. I think. Okay. All right, so what if I don't like this movie? Is that okay? I mean... I don't think it is. Is it, is it okay for... Is it okay for... Are you still lovable if you don't like it? No. <laughs> Let's just... Um, I did not like the movie, but I just want to know like, how critical I can get when I talk about it. How cri- you can get critical. I mean, it's going to be the same thing with the cats. Like, it's obviously that you're missing something. It's my fault. It's my it's be your fault. deficiency. Yeah, it's my right. deficiency if it, I don't... I, um, you're, yeah. Because this movie is perfect in almost every way just like mary poppins practically perfect <laughs> practically perfect yeah. um gosh now you're interviewing me and putting me in the hot seat oh i can't my, wait yeah. my no my okay my impressions i gotta get comfortable for this i thought dick van dyke was unbelievable unbelievably good yes ah uh, yeah uh-huh. he was a, i don't think there's anyone out there today that has that range of skill, his body, his control over his body, his yeah. mastery over how he makes things that are incredibly difficult look so easy yeah. is a marvel to watch. Super lovable character. I think that there is a world in which this movie is not called Mary Poppins. I think it could be called Bert. He stole the film. I thought he had way more of an impact than her. Oh, talk about that. I think that... He um, he's more entertaining. I think this he embodied the spirit of what Mary Poppins would not explain. I never explain anything. Remember she said that. Oh yeah, I have a I. What does she say? I have a uh, a rule or something. Yeah, but she doesn't say rule. But anyway, yeah. Um, I think he embodies that. I think he lives it, and I think um, I think he's much more skilled interpersonally than her. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in all of this. I think he's, I mean, his ability to connect with people and the warmth that he exudes when talking to the children or talking to Mr. Bank, like he makes explicit, I mean, what a clinician, 
when he's like empathizing with with Mr. Banks at the end, or Mr. Bank is it is it Mr. An Banks? S? Mr. Banks with an S, which is funny because he works in the bank. So, right. um, whimsical. Yeah, he he empathizes with uh, how the the children like ruined his bank experience and how he should you know he's like basically making paradoxical clinical statements like yeah of course you shouldn't have time to wipe your kid's nose when they right. want all your attention and love like they, don't they understand how important you are yeah and it's like that's a classic clinical move but he sure. does it in warmth so he's like empathizing but also inviting him to see a different perspective mm-hmm. like Mary Poppins is not explicit with what she's doing in fact I mean what's the most influential about Mary Poppins is the magic that she offers she and she they go on journeys with her into these magical experiences uh-huh. but she doesn't make she doesn't provide explicit corrective emotional experiences in fact she denies that she even does magic she said, what are you talking about? I'm a proper lady. I, I... It's so interesting what you're saying because of who you are. Hmm. Because when I see it, <clears throat> um, Bert is parenting yes. the child inside of Mr. Banks. Mr. Banks. Yes. Mary Poppins is parenting Mr. Banks in a different way. Yes. So she kind of like lets him have his little tantrum, but she's in in some ways like almost dismissive of him, right? Where she, she says is like, I'm sorry, firm. are you ill? And it's what he needed. He said, I want firmness and sternness in a nanny. And she right. is firm and stern with him. When she says to him, I'm sorry, sir, are you ill? It's like, she, it's like it's like so preposterous that he's doing what he's doing. Hmm. It's like when you when you're looking when at your looking, kid and you're well, like, yeah, and and it he is so right boastful and he's so puffed up, but not really, right? He he's desiring like the the people at the bank to recognize him, right? And instead he gets fired, right? But she makes him feel like he's so crazy that it like knocks him off of his game. Yes, she disorients him. She totally disorients him. Yes. And her deep desire, she knows what she's doing. She definitely knows what she's doing. She came in there to show him what he's missing out on and to reparent him and his wife, right? Yeah, right. But I'm just saying she doesn't, she's not verbal about it. That's my whole thing. I think Bert is more verbal. Even when he relates to the kids, he like is very warm and he like explains things. He's more explicit. For her, it's, Take your children to work tomorrow. That's it. Right, but she's challenging. Yes, but she doesn't say what it is that she's doing. That's all I'm saying. I know, but I feel like it's funny because with you, you were saying like you, um, your learned skill set is empathy. Your natural skill set is directiveness. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of like, I would never pick up in the movie on Bert. Bert's His interpersonal empathy. skills? Never. Oh, he's so empathic. Never. He's so warm. Um, I think that she's such a beautiful example mm. of um, she has like a really good mothering energy. She's not smothering of the kids. She's very structured. She's very structured. But if you notice the beginning of the movie, the kids have run away from all these nannies. They need the kids need a structure. They need and structure. I, I think. I think. People need different things at different points in their life. Sure. And she provided something that something that he needed. Right. The, and then Mr. She, Bank and the kids. And, right. Right. I mean, it, that one line was pretty crushing, though, to the kids. What one? At the end. Oh. If um, I, if I, what, what would it be? Who would I be if I loved every children I care, a child that I cared for? Oh, but they know that that's not, that that's not. How do we know that they know? They're children. I know, but don't, can't you... It's I would like, like to. It's like her I, mo. I would like to believe that they know, but I don't know that they know. That was like this is what I mean about her not having the same clinical skill as Bert. <gasps> Bert would be like, "Of course I love you. <laughs> of course I love you, little one." You know, like it would be something like that. You know, it would be yeah, explicit. But, but can you imagine? Okay, the scene where she's putting the kids to bed. If Bert were doing it, he'd be like, "Oh, you don't want to? Okay, like let's keep. Okay, oh, one more no, book, one more no. story." And she, instead, she goes, "No, you don't have to go to sleep." Stay awake. Yeah, yeah, It's the yeah. whole song. Stay yeah, awake. Yeah. Don't go to sleep. Yeah. It's like they, it's like a security in the idea that like she's never going to give them like the, 
the answer. It's always going to be like the opposite of what she's saying. Like she creates stay. context for people to discover their own answers. Right, which is why like her parents, which is wonderful. Mr. Banks is beautiful because what the kids need is not a nanny who loves them. It's a parent who loves them. It's their parents and their mom is saying like women's rights, and then she comes home. She in the song they're singing like we love, um, we love men individually, <laughs> but we agree as a group they're rather stupid. Yes. And then she comes in and her husband is singing, when I come home, the children are like washed. I pat them on the head and they go to bed. They go to bed. I'm not going to engage with them at all. My wife brings me my drink and my slippers. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Right. And meanwhile, right. all day long, the kids are with the nanny and she's fighting for women. Like, it's hysterical. She's an absentee mother. Totally. She's not a great mom. She's a not a good mom at all. And yeah. he's not a good dad. It's like they're no. reparented by Mary Poppins showing them like what they need. Yeah, but did did well, I, I wonder if there's something to be said that as the father goes, so does the rest of the household. Because the mom there was no real transformative experience for the mother. It was like suddenly dad was different and then she's like, Okay, we'll yeah. engage with the kids. I mean, I mean there was a little bit along the way with her saying, like, they're just children. Her trying to trying to help she's him like, see. Listen, listen to their ad. Like, but she's listen. also like, oh, I don't want to take the kids today. I'm out. Yeah, I mean, well, she burnt, hey, stranger, hey, chimney sweep, can you watch my kids while I leave? Because my, like, I can't find my nanny right now. <laughs> I mean, that's child abuse. <laughs> like, where was, what was her transformation? Well, I don't know if she's I don't, a I don't know if she character. had the same, right, yeah. I don't think she had the same character development as the, as the father. No, and she's so, like a caricature. Yeah. Right, of yeah. like, a, of a, of a mom. Um, no, I, I don't think so either. But, but, like what you're saying with the father so goes like right the rest of the family it's almost like okay it gives her like the freedom to then do what sort of probably came a little bit naturally and the yeah. time period and the fact that they're wealthy like yeah there's a lot of like social she didn't have to live in fear of the the husband's mood and right or she's not like and, yeah she's not yeah. like holding a baby and washing you know clo like yeah. th they're wealthy she the kids it's like a natural social thing the kids are like with you know yeah with the nanny blah 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 but i mean more to my point about the closest Mary Poppins gets to making explicit what her actual philosophy is, is the song about the bird mm. and feeding the birds. That was her treatise on parenting. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. like, take the time out yeah. to enter into their world and feed the, feed the birds and the saints and apostles will be smiling down upon you if you do. Yeah, but that but that's it. But that, that 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 I think encapsulates her whole perspective. But she doesn't like explain herself, as she said, elsewhere in any any way. Bird embodies it because Bert, like he's the the talk about Catholic mindfulness. He's as mindful as you could possibly get. Yeah. He's the artist that's attached to nothing. He's a different thing every day. He's begging for for coins, you know, yeah. so that he can tuppence tuppences yeah. to to live off of. He's one day he's doing. He starts off with the you know the instruments attached to his body the next yeah. he's painting uh pictures yeah. uh, on the sidewalk the next he's a chimney sweep yeah. he's just the ultimate free spirit of living in the present moment and he says i am happier than anyone yeah and then and you compare that to the the dad and and the spirit in the bank of of don't you see how you will be happy if you conquer the world through money yeah yeah and none of them are happy no yeah None of them are happy at all. <laughs> it's like structure and frame and pursuing things in, of this life does not make you happy. And Bert, who's got nothing, yeah, is as mindful as it gets. I'm telling you, I'm going to convince you how awesome Bert is. I know. I he, I've always loved him. I just haven't hadn't thought about it. Uh, hadn't thought about his character deeply. Mary Poppins to me is just. Um. There's just something so like, it's like she's a mystery. It's like she's the she's the mystery and what she does is like so magical and she doesn't have to say it like what she's doing sure she's just sort of like she's moving things right as she as she sees that they need to be moved mm -hmm. um without saying what she's doing without which saying which is a skill doing. i'm not saying it's it's I'm to just... the point where like she think she makes him think he's crazy yes like and she said and she says it's like almost she but she's like are you when he's looking in the chimney. Yeah. yeah. And, she, and he's like fumbling and he's like, I, I know I put it here and she knows. Yes. Are you ill? 
Um, and she, like, it's, she's like, she can be very dismissive, right? But it's like, she she's moving the chess pieces around. Yes. Where they need to go, where they don't even know that they're not in the right spot yet to even begin playing the game. Yes. Can we talk for a moment about Bert and Mary's relationship? Isn't that odd? Well. What is it? Seems like there's a little sexual tension. <laughs> he loves her so much. But here, well, every time I go one direction with it, there's something that pulls me in the other direction. Okay. Because one, the first direction is like, wait a minute, are they into each other? They're dancing. He's like, like he's like speaking to her as a lover would. Right. And then he says, we all love Mary Poppins. He doesn't say, I love Mary Poppins. Yeah. And then he's also going on about all the different women in that song. Oh yeah, and like, all, like, is he a womanizer? Like, all he he just lists all these different women, and How they're he's not like, as great as Mary. We're great as Mary, yeah. and she's like a little jealous as he's doing it. Her oh, facial yeah. reaction. But I don't think I could be wrong about this. It's something to look up. I don't believe that as a nanny, like you, um, you wouldn't be married. I don't know. It's like a single vocation. I think I've unlocked it though. I think I've unlocked it. Great. And only because I Wikipedia things a little bit. I was just gonna say you already googled. Yeah. Uh, I think this is uh, illustrated in Mary Poppins Returns. I know. I know. But. And I do love Emily Blunt. And I love Emily Blunt. And that there's like, okay, I'll give it a chance because it's Emily Blunt. But I haven't, I haven't seen it. But what they point out is Michael and Jane, the kids, yeah. are old and have kids. So Mary Poppins is like this right. eternal figure. Yes. She's either a witch or a fairy or something. Yeah. She's not a human being. Right. And I think what they point out is that Mary Poppins was Bert's nanny. Impossible. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, Which, let me think about this. This would even explain why he's like, he's not talking about other women that he was interested in. He was talking about other nannies that he had. And she was just jealous about... In the books, actually, she's pretty vain. You know, I learned this in the Wikipedia, too. That's another thing, to she, Yeah. She's the mirror and everything, and she's... Sure. Yeah, that's her weakness, her shortcoming. But she was... You know, it wasn't that she was jealous of other women that Bert had had, but it was, she was jeal- like jealous of other nannies that he would even mention in the same breath as her. And his whole personality, the free spirit who was able to live in the moment, basically came from him being mothered by her once upon a time. So there is no sexual tension. It's just like a kid honoring his mom. Mm, maybe. I mean, yeah, maybe. I was going to push back on that um, and say that, well, one, this is em- embarrassing to admit. I haven't read the book, actually. There's five books, I think. It's a whole series of books. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know how many, but I know that it's more than just this and Mary Poppins Returns. Um what was I going to say? I um, would assume that she wa- she wasn't his nanny just based on the fact that he's a chimney sweep, which would imply to me that like like it, like you know it's like very much like a like a like a, a social sh- yeah like a social a class thing a social class in right in London at that time right maybe. so maybe maybe I mean I'm she's wrong. Mary Poppins she obviously. Tran, uh, transcends socio- socioeconomic status. She no. says, I take every Tuesday off. Right. Is, um, right. But, but something about it is like, they're sort of like, they sort of stay true to like that, um, that structure of, of like a social, mm. social class. Um, the thing that's interesting about him naming names is, could be that maybe even if she wasn't his nanny, that he knows about other nannies. And that he's saying like, oh, she's yeah. not as like this. And it, so maybe yeah. he's still talking about nannies. I don't know. You know, um, it seems sort of like he, he just was loves fathering. Her very much. Yeah. And he was fathering everyone and she was mothering everyone. Yeah. There's a part of me that's like, well, why don't they just hook up? Like she, be the parents. She, yeah, but she, but you can't because she's yeah. a nanny. That's yeah. her sing, It's a single vocation. She's got to go hang out in the clouds for a couple days and wait for the next Mirror to pop up. Emotional crisis or wind to change. <laughs> there was an right. interesting thing going on with the weather. Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, the Admiral's talking about the weather. Look out. There's a big weather change coming. Yeah. Mr. Banks, he's screaming after him as he's walking down the street. Right. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure exactly the one-to-one connection the between the weather. 
uh, yeah. petals are, are blowing. Yeah, and then, you know, she's up in the clouds. Yes. Just kind of hanging out until... What I'm also wondering... Um, gosh, it left. It'll come back. It'll come back. It'll come back. Um, Will it come back like Mary Poppins? <laughs> no. There's that, there, uh, there's that point, too, where... Uh, she's having a conversation with her umbrella later. Yeah. And she's trying to have a stiff, stiff off upper lip uh-huh. about not receiving thanks and gratitude for everything she did and how she's detached. Yeah. She has to remain somewhat detached even though she really does love every she child. Does. And, sure. you know, she won't even let the duck umbrella say that she loves the kids. Right. Um, what do you think a happy ending for Mary Poppins is? For her? Yeah. I mean, Mar- um, marriage and family. <laughs> no, I think that it's such. I mean, if we believe that, like in a single vocation, sure, it's tremendous. It reminds me of like one of the sisters, right? Where you're just like, she's really given. She has made the ultimate sacrifice of her life mm-hmm. for the good of other of children and other and families. Right? Yeah, she, yeah, that's really profound. Um, so much so. That it's hard for her to even look at her vocation beyond the structure of it, <clears throat> because it's like would be so painful to recognize her own feelings on things when she's trying to deliver what she is as a gift, as a sacrifice to herself for those people, and to say like you know like she's she has to be detached because. Because she does love them so deeply, right? And you can't not. Um, what is the ultimate uh, happiness for Mary Poppins? Um, I think I would imagine that in many vocations, as painful as it will be, and I tell Elijah this probably un- very unhealthy, um, I want them to stay with me forever and ever and ever, right? I want them to all just stay, don't leave, stay with mom. Um, would that be my ultimate happiness? No. No. My ultimate happiness is to go through what's painful for the good of my children and and for my own self-sacrifice, right? Like which I do on a daily basis. The ultimate is to let them go and let them suffer. And let them suffer. And That's it's very Marian, isn't it? And right? And so Mary Poppins ultimate I think she is ultimately happy. She does what she sets out to do. Yeah. It's hard. Um, It's painful. It doesn't mean that she's not happy. Mm. And it doesn't mean that she's not um, joy-filled, right? Because, like, you can have have the joy of the Lord and be sad, Mm -hmm. experience pain. Um, And what she's doing is hard. It's hard work. Sure. It takes like, I can't even imagine the, the, um, the emotional and mental toll that it takes to, to, uh, to reparent a man like Mr. Banks. But it's almost like she has that detachment so she can sort of see what he needs for who he is and she doesn't take him personally and she, in fact, is like kind of dismissive of his like parts, right, yes. that are there. Um, so that's my answer. I think that she is ultimately happy. I think mm. that's her ultimate happiness is her, her vocation. Is any part of this wish fulfillment for you? Say it. Differently. Um, do you wish that she was your nanny? Oh, gosh. Do I wish that I, I mean, had a I, nanny like Mary Poppins? I mean, you've had various <laughs> types of experiences with nannies. Yeah. I mean, I'd say at least 9% of every conversation that you and I have ever had, it's mm-hmm. been about your current nanny Situa- situation. Situation. <laughs> yes. I don't so it's interesting that, like, I know that this is in your headspace, yeah. na- nannies and babysitters. Sure. And, you know, actually, we can have some empathy for them, building off your last point of how hard it is to live in that. Oh, my to gosh. Work, to work in that space. Yes. And to, to attach and then detach. And where do, where do I end? And not where's, even that. I'm in the family. I'm not in the family. I love these kids like a mom. And then I got to leave. To and, deal with the parents. And the parents, yes. Right. To deal with the parents. Right. That's no walk in the park. Right. I so, mean, so, I mean, unintended. Mary so Poppins. Would you love the, like, to, just to see the um, um, silhouette of the umbrella coming down to you? I would love to be parented by Mary Poppins hmm. because she was a genius at 
like I said, like in my mind, what she's doing is she sees like someone wants to play chess badly, but all they know how to do is like throw all the chess pieces on the table. Yeah. And <clears throat> she takes them and starts to show them like how to line them up properly so that you can play a game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what's really hard sometimes for me as a parent to figure out where the chess pieces belong so that we can play the proper game. So I don't necessarily need my children to be nannied by, by a nanny her. like Mary Poppins. You need to be nannied. I would really love to be, yeah, like nannied by Mary Poppins so that... It's beautiful. I'm able to then figure out where my chess pieces need to need to be, right? Because like, and this is how it's supposed to be. I'm, I should be the best person to parent my children. Yeah. That's interesting because I, there's a, there's a part of me that would love the detached fathering of Bert. Yeah. And, uh, the warmth. Yeah. The warmth and the accessibility and don't worry about it. Everything's fine and you're safe and And it's goofy. Yeah. It's fun. It's light. Uh, you know, I think, I think it sounds like Mary Poppins has had an influence on you and your own development because one of the, one of my premises of this show is that God parents us through many different means. Oh yeah. One of which is fictional characters. Definitely. I have yep. ha- I've had a lot of fictional characters that have like influenced my own development, goals I've had for myself, like uh, personality traits that I've worked towards. Do you have a list? Do you ever like journal with a list of those people? I, I have a list. I, that's great. I don't like journaling. That's not my thing. But yeah, I mean, it's the same, at least mental exercise. Yeah. Is she on your list? Oh, definitely. Nice. Mary Poppins is on I mean, if you could take like the most perfect examples, right, and combine them. So she's on my list. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a firmness, a detached, like there is... Um, a self-preservation that's like a healthy self-preservation that she has that's very desirable, right? Like she's not really moved emotionally. And like, like there's the, I love to laugh scene where she's just like, you know, kind of like she's had it, but truly. <laughs> that's a great scene. It is a good scene. Truly. And uh, she is not moved, right? In like the big picture. Um, her, <laughs> what, what, what about it is so funny. The whole think, thing. Of, think of the meta right yeah. now. Think of the whole meta. Yeah. I'm on the ceiling right yeah. now. And you're like trying to explain something <laughs> serious to me. Yeah. And like the, the contagiousness of the laughter. I'm just thinking yeah. about that scene. I like almost lost your train of thought because. It's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. No, but I actually think um, the guy who obviously did the voice for the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. Uh-huh. Uncle um, Albert. Yeah. Uncle Albert. I mean, he's, his laugh is so contagious. I thought the funniest line is when Bert, Bert goes up there and he's like, oh, I was hoping you'd turn up. We always have such a great time. <laughs> like the real him. Like yeah. he was talking to a part of Bert. Because right. in the beginning, Bert's just like trying not to yeah. like laugh, whatever. And when he said, I'm hoping you would turn up, he saw Bert was in the room. Yeah. He was hoping the part of Bert that would have fun and laugh would turn just up. Just like let him out. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry to throw you off. but No, yeah. The laughter is contagious. 